Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Online Cosmo Inference Seminar, uh, Fall 2022. Uh, <clears throat> so today, uh, we're back in a slightly different time. Next week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled time. And uh, today, we have a talk by Dominic Yanti from Amazon Research on a formal framework for quantitative root cause analysis. After Dominic's talk, we'll have a short discussion by Nicholas Pfister, who is uh, from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, as always, uh, you please feel free to submit your questions during the entire talk. At some point, Dominic will stop and um, take your questions. And for how to submit your questions in those discussions, I'll take it over to our own Dominic. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, please. Yeah, thank you, Emma. So yeah, as usual, please submit your questions uh, via Q&A. Um, and then uh, when uh, Dominic stops, or well, the other Dominic stops, uh, we will bring the question to him or we will ask you to kind of unmute yourself. Yeah, with that, I'll hand over to uh, Dominic. Uh, yeah, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Let me briefly check that I take the right slides. Do you see my slides? Uh, we do. They yeah, are. But I need to change to the Full right screen. mode, right? Okay. That looks good. Okay, so I'm so presenting. Dominic, uh, we still uh, see your uh, the little window on general information on the right side of the window. Uh, then let me check that. Right. I rarely use uh, Zoom. Is this better? Yeah, we still see, see this little info window. It looks like uh, when you look at the file name slides and so on. So you yeah. can just close that. Yeah. Um, now it's fine, actually. No, you no. But now you see you yeah. see a little bit more than the slide, right? Yeah, yes. we see a bit more. Um, and let me. Hmm. Can you move? Can you move your cursor a little bit to the right so that I can turn to the right, to the right, to the right, and then in the middle? Yeah, in the middle there is this this general. He doesn't. Does he not see what we see? I think probably, mm -hmm. yeah, Dominic, you're probably not seeing the little window that's open there. Yeah, but I can't really access it right now. Okay, <laughs> now then we'll just run. Yeah, let's again. just start. So uh, the framework for quantitative root cause analysis. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so as I will point out also later, um, this talk is not, not really about an algorithm or any particular method, it's more about um, a concept. Uh, what's the right concept for root cause analysis? And um, you can think of uh, several um, complex systems or, uh, in real world, like Amazon supply chain or uh, the dependent servers in AWS cloud computing. And um, the goal is to understand the system uh, in the sense of understand the role of each component, for instance, for anomalies or for distribution change or whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, for instance, um, an on hand inventory level uh, planning system, or you have uh, forecasted demand or whatsoever, and you want to understand. Uh, anomalies or distribution shifts. And um, this will be the outline of the talk. Um, I will put root cause analysis in the general context of causal contribution uh, of mechanisms. So a kind of modular perspective uh, where we decompose the system into modules um, that can be changed independently. Um, I will describe root cause analysis of outliers and root cause analysis of distribution change as examples. And I will show practical implementation of root cause analysis of outliers. Um, 
and discuss uh, philosophical aspects of causal contribution. So the modular perspective in graphical models, that should be quite familiar. So we have a causal Bayesian network where the distribution decomposes um, into the conditional distributions of each uh, node given its parents, its direct causes. Um, a more fine-grained uh, model is the functional causal model where every node is a deterministic function of its parents and the noise with independent noise variables. <clears throat> we will need uh, both kind of modular decompositions and we think of and the functional causal model as the uh, from of the structural equations as the independent models uh, modules and uh, in the causal median Bayesian network the uh, conditional distributions of each node given its causes. Um, first, I want to emphasize that root cause analysis is um, significantly, significantly different from analyzing treatment effects. Because uh, let's say you, you see the following chain of events. You have a thunderstorm, it causes a power outage, and this in turn causes a server outage, and that causes a revenue drop of some business. Then if you analyze, for instance, uh, the treatment effect of two interventions on server outage on revenue, then you will see, of course, it has an impact on revenue, but uh, nevertheless, you would not consider this the root cause because the, the root cause is uh, further upstream. So <clears throat> um, do interventions just show the behavior um, of a target variable with respect to a treatment, but it doesn't tell you whether the uh, the root just responded to something further upstream. So this is the the crucial difference um, that uh, is essential for this talk. Um, I want to put, as I said, root cause analysis in the context of general attribution problems, and um, uh, root cause analysis of outliers, where we attribute anomalies of a target variable quantitatively to its uh, ancestors. Uh, root cause analysis of distribution change where the, we attribute distribution shift to the different conditional distributions in the causal Bayesian network. We have intrinsic causal contribution, not really root cause analysis. It attributes the variation, so the variance of a target to its mechanism. And you can do that for many different uh, attribution problems. Um, so what do we mean by contribution of mechanisms? So the idea is to replace the mechanism at the node, at the respective node, with a baseline mechanism and explore the impact of replacement on the target quantity which defines the contribution of that particular mechanism. And replace mechanisms one after another, um, we get contributions that sum up to the joint contribution um, when we replace all the nodes with baseline mechanisms. So that's also crucial for our kind of contribution. Um, I mean, the word contribution implies contribution to something. So we want to tell um, what is the quantity these contributions sum up to. And they are supposed to sum up to something meaningful. So this is the key idea that we always have um, at the back of our mind. It should sum up to something meaningful. But the problems are in this, um, and this idea, uh, what's the baseline? And that will be a quite a fundamental problem, as you will see later. Um, and the contribution computed this way depends on the order of replacements. So in general, the DAG doesn't uh, have a unique ordering of nodes. So we have to tell 
in which order we want to replace with base value mechanisms. Um, this we have applied to the root cause analysis of outliers again, where we replace the extreme noise value and J with a default value and the default will just be the natural observation observed distribution of the noise variable. In distribution change, we replace the conditional with some baseline conditional and intrinsic causal contribution, we set the random noise to some constant noise. <clears throat> um, okay, now I want to uh, a little bit um, uh, discuss why we replace mechanisms versus replacing values. Um, so replacing a mechanism at a node changes the way it reacts to its parents. And this reveals the, the role of a node better than replacing its values. Nodes that just propagate the value from parent to child um, do not contribute to an event. Um, okay, and um, replacing, then I should uh, emphasize that changing the noise to a baseline value is perfectly aligned with this perspective because uh, changing the noise replaces the deterministic mechanism. Um, maybe you're aware of the so-called response function formulation, um, which phrases every functional causal model without loss of generality as a distribution over the functions from the parents to the node. So every noise without loss of generality is function valued. This interpretation is quite valuable because then um, you see that the strict uh, um, difference between whether the function changed or the noise changed disappears. Um, but I will comment on that later. Um, so let me implement this idea for root cause analysis of outliers as examples. So first we want to quantify anomalies. And what is quite convenient is a log probabilistic outlier score. Um, it measures basically the tail probability, the minus logarithm of the tail probability after applying some feature map G. This feature map G admits generalization to multivariate and non-numeric uh, variables. Um, so examples would be just the usual one-sided tail probability of an extreme value. What's the probability of getting an even more extreme value uh, or the distance from the mean. <clears throat> and then we recursively write the target node as a function of its ancestor noise variables by inserting these functions from the FCM into each other. And then the contribution of each input and J to the anomaly at the target node N is defined by the logarithm of the quotient of the probability of the tail event, given that you adjust the first J inputs, the first J noise terms, versus you adjust only the first J minus one noise terms. So it describes, um, the logarithm of the factor by which the outlier is made more likely by that particular value of the noise. And uh, because this contribution is still order dependent, we symmetrize over all orderings of inputs and uh, get Shapley values. Um, you're smiling. <laughs> um, um, okay, so a nice contribu contribution is the logical end gate, where Y is just um, the end of the inputs. 
then the outlier score is a sum of the input outlier scores. So um, minus log the probability of obtaining a one at the target is just the sum over minus log of the probabilities of and having an n at the inputs. And it turns out that uh, according to our framework, the contribution of uh, the input xj reads minus log the probability of that event. So it turns out that only rare events get high contribution. So frequent events cannot get high contributions, but it's not in the general framework, it's not true that every rare event gets a high contribution because what counts is the impact on the target. Um, however, the other way around, um, an event that is not rare can't get high contribution. And um, intuitively, this makes sense. Um, and it's nice that this potential stronger contribution of rare events is not put in by hand, but just results naturally from the framework. For um, frequent events, replacing the true value with samples from the natural distribution cannot change the likelihood of the outlier event that much. That aligns with the intuition that a historically strong drop of Dow Jones cannot be explained by an event that happens twice a week. Um, example with two dice. So the, the rare event would be uh, to have one one with both of the dice. Um, so we have a logarithm of four times 100 for this outlier event. It decomposes into log four plus log 100. So the contribution of the yellow die is 23% roughly versus 77% 77 of, of the blue one. Um, so as a summary, root cause analysis of anomalies uh, provide a scale independent quantification via probabilistic scores explains anomalies in terms of ancestor anomalies via an FCM. It quantifies contribution via counterfactual change of log probabilities, which achieves comparability across measures with different units. And Shapley values achieve symmetry with respect to reordering of nodes. And nodes with highest contributions can be called root causes. <clears throat> Now I want to uh, um, talk about two common misunderstandings that we heard repeatedly. Um, your RCA of anomalies assumes that every anomaly is caused um, by an anomaly of some noise term in J, but also the functions FJ could be anomalous. And this I mentioned already. Um, if you really look what uh, what the framework does, uh, you see that we do not really care whether the function fj or the noise nj has changed or has anomaly behavior, uh, because this difference does not even exist in the response function formulation. Um, the node can only be a root cause if xj, the observed value, cannot be explained uh, by the usual FCM with a normal noise value. And this can happen either if the noise was anomalous or the function was anomalous at that particular event. Um, the second misunderstanding that we had to discuss a lot with reviewers back then, um, your RCA for anomalies is based on hypothetical interventions on the noise, which are considered very unnatural. Um, even if it's not hypothetical, people don't accept that. But that is not even true. I don't want to discuss whether this is a problem, but for me it wouldn't, but it's not even true. We only need hypothetical interventions on observed nodes because the impact of changing the noise and j to n tilde j um, 
changes the observed node xj from the uh, from fj p a and j with, to the one with a different noise value and this is an intervention so it's just a parent dependent intervention on the observed node you don't have to act on the noise at all <clears throat> um i want to be a bit less um detailed about uh, root cause analysis of distribution change, although it, I would say it's a quite robust method and it um, is free of several obstacles, uh, practical obstacles of root cause analysis of anomalies, but uh, nevertheless, let me just explain the concept. So the joint distribution changes to P tilde, and we want to attribute this to the different mechanisms. So um, if you like information theory, you may appreciate that KL distance decomposes nicely into the sum of conditional KL distances uh, with a small caveat that the conditional KL distances contain the distribution of parents. So it's not strictly speaking a property of the mechanism alone. But um, I think this is... Uh, a small issue that cannot be avoided for fundamental reasons. Um, in this context, uh, it makes sense to, to mention the sparse mechanism uh, shift hypothesis, which is in a paper on towards uh, causal representation learning of Bernard Jacob and co-authors. Um, it's the hypothesis that um, small distribution changes tend to manifest themselves in a sparse shift of mechanisms. So only few of these conditionals would change typically. Of course, it's not any, it's a more awake and unformal hypothesis, but uh, in this context, we would assume that only a few of the conditionals changed. And therefore, for the practical in implementation, we introduce a binary label L indicating the data set. And then um, the statement that the conditional distance chain didn't change is just equivalent to a conditional independence. And this way we can identify the mechanisms that changed. Um, however, it's uh, for applications more interesting to just look at uh, certain target nodes and statistical properties, for instance, an expectation of some target node, it's more realistic than just monitoring the entire distribution with n nodes. And um, then we can still replace each of the mechanisms step by step in any ordering. And then this um, change of the distribution decomposes into an order dependent contribution where we again average overall orderings to get sharply value based contributions okay i think i don't want to go more to the details um this is um the attribution of I'm just wondering about the time okay um the for the variance you can do the same i don't want to yeah go to the details there um and um here i should mainly mention that um i wouldn't doubt that for simple examples uh Root cause analysis can also be done by some kind of mediation analysis to, to just distinguish of what part has been inherited from the parents and what has been generated by that particular node. But for complex systems, we don't see an approach for causal attribution that is equally simple conceptually. Um, so to summarize the properties desired for causal attribution in the sense of this talk is that is applicable to any causal DAG and no contribution to nodes that just propagate invariant with respect to reordering of nodes and um, 
continuous with respect to removing infinitely weak causal links. And that is a property, a property that is really problematic for quite some contribution methods uh, that I've seen in the literature and that I have been rejecting for our work for that reason. Uh, although they have uh, good justification in their own right. Um, a simple experiment for uh, RCAF anomalies, the extreme river flow at four stations <clears throat> in England. Uh, so um, NGR, New Jumbles Rock, is uh, downstream. And the other three locations are upstream but from different rivers, uh, rivers and uh, upstream of New Jumbles Rock, there's a confluence point. And then we want to explore whether anomalies in NJR are caused by anomalies upstream. And of course we have precipitation as confounders, so let's say a more global precipitation. Um, here we see an extreme value of uh, the river flow in mid of March in 2019. And uh, we see that the other stations also show that anomaly. Therefore, we hope to see that they contribute significantly. Um, where do we get the functional causal model from? I would say just domain knowledge. So. The assumption is all structure coefficients are one, which just means that no water gets lost as an approximation. And the noise is just the water entering the river between parents' nodes and the uh, nodes and the node under consideration. Um, what the results show is that and GR itself shows no contribution, and the other three share the contribution almost equally. Um, what do we con conclude from that? Um, that's also an important point that if several mechanisms are simultaneously anomalous, there's probably a confounder, uh, for instance, high precipitation in a large region. region. If you think of this sparse mechanism shift hypothesis, then you wouldn't assume that all of these mechanisms corrupt simultaneously. So there's probably a mechanism for the upstream. So it's also probably an indicator for violation of causal sufficiency. The practical implication <clears throat> So we infer the FCM either from domain knowledge or learn it from data subject to strong assumptions, for instance, additive noise. We compute the true values of the noise for the outlier. And uh, this is of course only feasible if this, uh, the function in the FCM is invertible for fixed value of the parents. And then we generate normal noise values via samples from the past. Um, there's a lot of practical problems. Um, I want to be honest about that. Um, um, generating normal values from the past is problematic if there are seasonalities. And uh, learning the functions of the functional causal model in the outlier region is statistically ill posed, of course. And um, the scaling behavior of the method is currently unclear. However, the main contribution, as I emphasized, is not the practical method and the specific algorithm. It's more uh, the, the scope of defining a clear concept of root cause analysis, and um, which includes a quantitative contribution analysis, because this is what, what customers ask you all the time. So uh, what's the quantitative contribution then? As a mathematician, you would say, well, you can't tell in percentage because it's nonlinear, but you can also say, okay, uh, people want a quantitative contribution, so we must invent one. Um, 
So this, despite tons of papers on RCA, we didn't find a clean concept. Um, but I think there's also a limit of formalizing root cause analysis because there are normative aspects uh, that are neither captured by statistics nor by causality. So let's say, for instance, you have a thunderstorm, power outage, server outage, and the revenue drop. Then there can be uh, different op opinions on root causes, thunderstorm for obvious reasons, but you could also say power outage, yeah, so the network should be prepared for thunderstorms and server outage, the server should have emergency power. So um, if you talk to people and ask them about their intuition about root causes, you will realize that their idea of root causes always includes these normative aspects. And um, therefore the question is whether the mechanism, whether the framework is flexible enough to also capture that. And this is uh, something, an insight uh, that is very recent that if um, Baseline mechanisms are those observed in the past. So the statistical perspe perspective, the thunderstorm is the root cause here, uh, because the other mechanisms just behaved as they did in the past, or if as if they would have reacted in the past uh, to an equally strong thunderstorm. But um, if the baseline mechanisms represent our demands and ethical expectations, so the normative perspective, then any node can be considered the root cause. Uh, yeah, this is where I want to end. So the crucial papers are the two above. And then I should mention that uh, do why uh, meanwhile contains uh, our root cause analysis and distribution change. So this is open source. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for a nice talk. I think we have time for uh, at least one short question from uh, Q and A. Um, so in Q and A, someone asked whether this would also be applicable to other types of graphs. So I think the person has in mind, for example, that there is a CP deck instead of a deck. Would you then go through the equivalence class, or how how do you deal with the the deck is it's a good question i know it's an important question i don't have an answer yet i mean um yeah it could be a probabilistic attribution that also just yeah then we have uncertainty about the attribution um yeah we could also think of what are independent blocks in this like clusters of nodes and um, do a more coarse grained root cause analysis. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and and one other one. So currently, how, just to understand the whole pipeline. So how do you have it, what, what do you have in mind? So like in, you have in mind that someone has a, maybe the, the causal ordering and then someone fits a graph, like a, a causal model to it, maybe additive models, and then apply it to that. Like, have you tried out that pipeline? Do you have any particular recommendations on what kind of models to fit here? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, um, I mean, the, uh, this pipeline is in Dubai, so you can try it out for, I mean, um, it also has a documentation of toy examples. Um, it raises all the practical questions that I admitted. Um, so um, if you have simple functions, um, it works to some extent, but of course, uh, for more complex functions, there's um, all these issues of uh, ill postness of the ill-definedness of the, of the function and um, yeah, but uh, I think uh, then we need to talk also about probabilistic contribution analysis. Yeah. There's one other quick question I think that we have 
time for it um that just came in so like it's about scaling issues so how large of a dex can you can you handle or what like what what are the limitations you've seen in terms of scaling um <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's hard to say. It heavily depends on on, on the assumptions. Um, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, sure. No, no I don't want to commit there because yeah, I mean, if you have linear functions, then it scales much better. But of course, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, we have to see. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I think we should uh, head over to uh, Niklas Pister, who will will be the discussant. And after that, Dominic, you will have the opportunity to respond to. Yes. Yeah. So I should stop share. Perfect. All right. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm going to share my And the audience, you feel free to keep submitting questions if you want. Nicholas, you can share whenever you. Uh, yes, can um, figure it out. let me add it. Uh, let's see. Uh, it didn't work. Can you see the screen now? Great. Uh, good. So um, first off, um, uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, nice online format uh, once again. And um, also thanks to Dominic for, for a very uh, interesting uh, talk today and also uh, for, um, for some interesting papers that I, that I could read. So now as a short warning, um, I am no expert in uh, root cause analysis. So this is a little bit new also for me. Um, but I kind of now try to phrase it a little bit in my perspective, and then uh, we'll uh, hopefully get into a little bit of discussion with Dominic uh, at the end. Uh, good. So let me uh, kind of give you a little bit of uh, my flavor to uh, what I think this root cause analysis uh, setup that, that uh, Dominic is looking at here and boils down to in a bit of a simpler uh, setting. So. Uh, we start off from kind of a fixed causal model, which I here call this calligraphic M0, which is over a set um, of our observed variables um, X that we look at. And then there is a fixed uh, kind of DAG model underneath that is part of this causal model that we look at. And now I kind of consider three steps. So first, we assume kind of our system is generating some data according to this causal model. And then in a second step, we kind of think about now somewhere there is going to be some change within this model. So we're intervening very locally and changing our original causal model to now slightly different causal model and um, where we only affect certain of these variables. And kind of some of the changes that, that we saw also now in this talk is that we might um, do a noise shift or we might change the entire mechanism in some way. And But importantly, we keep the rest of the system the same. And then we let the system run again in a second uh, round. And now what we kind of are interested in in this root cause analysis is that we want to try and find basically what are the root causes of the change either in the entire distribution maybe or maybe also only in a marginal or some kind of quantity based on the distribution now what was responsible for this so which of the changes kind of uh, contributed the most uh, somehow to the change that i'm observing so this is kind of uh, my starting point for where i think uh, uh, for understanding kind of uh, what is going on here and just as a short example to illustrate this um, we think of a, a structural causal model or fcm as dominic said uh, and then we had we have kind of a graph, and now this is just a, a simple example. Then we do some intervention on it. So say here we're interested in kind of the green node, and now we intervene 
basically on x1 uh, and x5. And for example, in this outlier or anomaly detection thing, we would think about these two nodes as being the root cause of some outlier happening in x2 and x5. And now this propagates through our causal system. And we also see an outlier in x4. And now we want to go back kind of to what actually caused kind of x2 and x5 because we didn't see it. And importantly here is that we don't want to take uh, x3. And so we saw this in this thunderstorm example that Dominic presented. It's somehow in the middle because so the mechanism here from the causal perspective is kind of remaining entirely fixed, right? So nothing really is changing here. So this is really something that is a little bit different than if we look at causal effects also that I will be talking about uh, in a second. And then we see kind of that we have this anomaly detection and equivalently, we can also look at the same thing basically from the perspective of now having a marginally changing the entire mechanism uh, in certain variables. So it can add links, et cetera. And then we just care about the distribution change again in our variable. So this is exactly the same kind of idea. And as we will see, or as Dominic kind of showed is that this is somehow the same notion is kind of the, the right one that we want to have. And this is not so much a causal effect as more of somehow something different uh, that I will try to argue. So root causes somehow hard to define, I think with uh, causal effects directly. Good. And then what we saw uh, also nicely in this talk is a bit that this problem of associating root causes can somehow be phrased perfectly well as a causal attribution problem where we ask kind of how much of the change in Y or in some response variable that I'm interested in uh, is attributed due to each of the variables. So I want to give each of them somehow a score between zero and one, and then it should sum to one, uh, ideally. And here, I think the important thing is somehow this, uh, and this is also how it was mentioned in one of his uh, papers, is this notion of intrinsic uh, attribution. And I think, and now maybe I just picked one of these contributions that I feel like is kind of the key one. And this is exactly that there is no contribution that to propagating nodes. So if you have a system of these three nodes, x1, x2, x3, and x1 and x2 are basically this the same variables, so this mechanism is entirely deterministic, then you do not want to um, attribute uh, any importance to the variable x2 for that change. So the entire change should be kind of at, uh, only at x1. So I somehow need to separate this deterministic uh, notion from the from the stochasticity that comes in through this node x1. And I think this is kind of the key property, essentially. And now, um, given this goal, the, the question kind of is then, what is the correct causal attribution? And here, Dominic, of course, gave already the answer. And I will now uh, just repeat this basically from, uh, from in relation to, um, sorry, to um, total causal effects and direct effects. So if we think about a total causal effect, so what is this? This is just basically saying, I do a hard intervention on one of my variables, say x, j, and then I see what happens in my response variable y. So this is what the, so I fully control one variable and then I see what is happening in another one. With a direct effect, I basically do the same, but now I adjust for my other variables. So basically you think about fixing your jth variable and then fixing the other ones to what they were before. And then I just average it out here uh, just to remove uh, this dependence. And now what is the intrinsic effect of a variable? So this can be defined somehow similarly. And here it's kind of, I just, instead of intervening fully on my variable, I now go ahead and I just set in the structural uh, form of this variable that I'm interested in, I just replace the noise. And then I look kind of how does this affect you now my, um, my, my variable y. And this is, if you like, you can define it as a, also an intervention, of course, on your noise. If one does not like this, of course, it, it, it remains, as Dominic said, an intervention on your, on your structural equations as 
that is fine. And now, so why are these two things not kind of the right thing, what we want in terms of this propagation property that I mentioned before? Well, this is somehow, somehow obvious, right? Because so if you think about this example that you saw before, if you look at total causal effects, you're really intervening also on these deterministic propagating nodes. And then they will, they will immediately also get uh, a certain bit of contribution and uh, the direct cause effect is even more not what we want actually here because it really is somehow it finds the causes that are closest to what to what i'm looking at and this is of course not what root cause analysis is interested in good and maybe now some comments uh, to what i think about this intrinsic effect so i actually i thought this was a, a very uh, fascinating concept <laughs> uh, and interesting and i also thought so the examples now Dominic also mentioned they're very much like uh, supply chain and you have also these these like fixed physical systems of the river networks and so on, but I also thought actually that it relates somewhat to um, problems in biology where uh, one sometimes looks at variable importance in terms of finding kind of if you have some phenotype you want somehow the the genetic, the genes somehow that are closest maybe to some phenotype, but maybe actually you do want somehow the ones that have somehow this more this intrinsic effect. So I think also in other uh, fields, this might actually be an interesting notion to look at, given of course that it is uh, also a little bit more challenging, of course, uh, to compute in certain settings, in particular if the graph is not known. Uh, Good. Uh, yeah, so this I also mentioned, uh, I guess, before is that at first sight, this seemed also, if you look at kind of this intrinsic effect, it seems somewhat artificially and very uh, specifically targeted towards a, a, towards a causal model, right? So you're, you're not now only using the nodes as in a graphical model, but you're really going into now the structural form. And this immediately raised also in my mind a bit the question of how robust this notion actually is towards misspecifying your causal model in a certain way. Um, although, but now the last point that I, I want to make, which I think kind of should give the intuition actually that this is actually a relatively robust notion of, I think, a certain causal effect because and this is what I mentioned before, it's somehow what you're trying to do is somehow distinguish stochastic propagating effect from somehow a more deterministic mechanism. And you're just trying to split uh, those two up. And this seems somehow intuitively to me at least doable, although I haven't thought a whole lot about it. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, yeah. in any case, a uh, very nice uh, notion. Good. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go uh, too deep, so I would also like uh, a few questions. So I actually had a lot of questions, but um, uh, that were very specific. Uh, so I will focus on a little bit of the higher level questions because they might be more interesting uh, also for others to hear. So um, maybe this first one goes in relation to this robustness. So, uh, so I was wondering how, how are these methods affected if if, for example, parts of your graph somehow are misspecified, so you kind of, you only know that certain things are correct. Maybe I'll just uh, read all of them and then we can uh, discuss some of them. So and the second question I was thinking is, uh, is it possible, and this I guess goes a little bit into the setting, that if parts of the G are somehow unknown, and maybe this was a little bit more the CP DAG question before, so then can one somehow get control on some bounds potentially that say like, okay, so this node caused at most this much or something. And so I can get somehow an upper bound on, on how much or a lower bound on this contributed at least a bit to, to a system if I have somehow some uncertainty within my, my graphical model. And then the last one was already also answered. And you also uh, mentioned it a bit in your talk with these hidden variables. So maybe you can, uh, also discuss that a little bit more. Yeah, and with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, thank you, Dominic, and uh, your co-authors, of course, um, for very uh, few thought-provoking uh, and nice papers. Yeah, thanks a lot, Niklas, for 
this nice discussion for and uh, particular for your flexibility to uh, <laughs> to also process last minute slides um, um yeah so the the last question is just uh, so uh, we can deal with hidden common causes and uh, i think the the root cause analysis paper contains some remarks on that it's not uh, very detailed but uh, in principle the concept applies to hidden common causes um you just need to have the fcm and then you have dependent noise terms but you intervene on the noise so that uh, destroys the correlations between the noise terms anyway. yes i guess this is because you always basically condition on a full subset of nodes and then plus yeah, the yeah, one right yeah. and then it can, yeah, yeah okay so then this basically yeah, goes away if, if you have the correct model right so then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I think there were quite a few questions on robustness. I also see them yeah. in the chat. Also, uh, I didn't read the chat systematically yet. But uh, um, yeah, I think uh, the robustness, um, we are doing experiments on that. Um, it's, uh, I would say, too preliminary to comment on that. Um, it is crucial a crucial question um, and um, as i said so i could uh, i could think of uh, having larger modules in regions where we are un unsure about um, and apart from that uh, these confidence values need to be developed yes so mm -hmm. i just see that these are interesting research questions um, <laughs> that are asked in the chat uh, we haven't uh, fully answered them and uh, um, since uh, people ask about scaling and I didn't comment on that much um, I should say that um, I feel that many of these problems uh, are already interesting with a small number of variables so I don't consider root cause analysis with five, five variables trivial uh, simple in any way um, I mean, we all know that also uh, causal discovery with five variables is not easy at all. Uh, it may even get easier in some regards with more. But so um, I like to focus on small problems. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then there was a comment on um, Shapley values. Um, I would say uh, uh, Shapley values, we are not dogmatic at all about Shapley values and we don't sell this as the crucial point. I mean, it's a pragmatic way of getting rid of this ambiguity of the ordering of replacement. But um, I often hear it uh, that people say, oh, this method uses Shapley values and it sounds like as if this would already describe the method, but uh, I mean, we have published meanwhile, I don't know, at least five papers uh, with which contain Shapley values and all of them are substantially different. So um, it's just a way to get rid of the ordering and um, um, how you okay. deal with the combinatorial uh, problem in practice, uh, when it comes to many variables, this is an open problem, I would say, but there are approximations. Uh, okay. Can I ask one more? So actually uh, along these uh, Sharpie values, so if you, so I mean, the reason one, one looks also often at these is that one wants somehow this attribution property, right? Somehow that it sums to the total and then it has all these nice properties and this is the one solution to get it but so actually how how important do you think actually that the these like somewhat artificial properties of summing to one or like being like an actual attribution how important is this actually because so sometimes you could also think it would be fine if i somehow have a proper ranking or i have like just like some quantification of how much <laughs> i believe 
you know that doesn't doesn't necessarily yeah. need to have this additivity yeah I I, I, yeah and, um, and uh, uh, it makes sense to, to ask that but um uh for me it's the general belief the what is behind it is the general belief that um whenever you have a concept that is clean in this regard it's also more modular mm. so um it's hard to, to to explain that by examples uh, at least i couldn't uh, come up with one on the fly but uh, my belief is that when concepts are principled then um they have mm, they admit many different ways of interpreting them and are mm -hmm. in this regard more flexible and uh, uh, maybe i can directly comment on one other question in the chat are extensions to machine learning immediate say to neural network perspectives i'm not entirely sure whether it's just meant in the sense that the regression models um, are learned by neural networks if if this is the question then we already have that so um, you can learn you can use any uh, regression method at each particular node to learn the conditional distribution or to first learn the conditional expectation and then assume an additive noise model or whatsoever so this is exactly um the key idea to have this modular so i believe that uh, causal methods should be modular in the sense that they um that they build on top of machine learning methods so when machine learning advances you just replace these modules and therefore i'm emphasizing that it's not a particular algorithm it's just a concept of thinking about root causes thanks thank you Don. uh and nicholas for the discussion maybe we should then wrap up uh so i'll do that Right. Great. Uh, so yes, thank you again, uh, Dominic, for the nice talk and introduction to a new problem I didn't think about before. And Nicholas, thanks for uh, giving a new perspective on this as well. Uh, next week, we'll have a talk by Vasilis Sirganis from Stanford University on automatic debiased machine learning for dynamic treatment effects and general nested functionals. Um, so next time, uh, next week, we're back at our regular time, so 8.30 a.m. Pacific time or 11.30 a.m. Eastern time and so on. Uh, you can find that on the website. And so we hope to see you all there. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.